But we're going to have fun with that text when we get to it. But when I looked at verse 1 through 16, I and just kept looking at it, and I shared this on Monday morning, I just didn't think through it well enough to develop it, and God, by his spirit, just really brought something out to me that I didn't see before. And, I, and I've got to say, it's not direct, it's more indirect. Uh, but Paul, he loved the church. And I think there's something for us this morning as we think about the church. You know, the church can mean a lot of different things to different people, and it does. But really, we should line up with what the church, we start with what the church is, and then we understand how to relate to the church. Paul understood the church, and Paul related to the church. He had a love for the church. He loved, that the, church, he loved the church enough to spend his, his energy, his time, he gave his life to the church. It, it, it wasn't just preaching the gospel that Paul did. Paul loved people. And that just kind of comes out here. It kind of oozes out of the story. This is a wonderful narrative, and that's what we'll do next week. We'll just read the narrative story, and we'll talk about the points that God has given us through that story. But today, I want us to just look at verses 1 and 2, and we're going to see right out of the first couple verses... Paul oozing out love for the church and for people. Now, for context, let me give you this, that this is the third missionary journey, and at this time, he's in the same area generally that he had been previously, which would have been the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, you might remember we covered, the, uh, this, we covered a lot of ground in the last uh, uh, few months covering Acts, but Paul had visited Syria. He started in Syria. He went to Cilicia. He moved into Galatia, then the area of Phrygia and Pamphylia. And, and, and then he goes further away to, to Asia Minor. And from Asia Minor, then on to Macedonia. From Macedonia, he goes into Greece, with, which is Greece, and he goes into Achaia. And finally, with Corinth. He ends up in Corinth. And then from Corinth, he comes to Ephesus. I mean, Paul is covering a lot of ground, and, and he, because of the first and second missionary journeys, he's covered a lot of these areas before. So, so for some of these uh, cities, these are return trips. In other words, he's already established friendships, and he's going back to friends. I can't think of a better message this morning when I think about Bill McClellan, you know, and the, how, what, just look at Bill's life. What really mattered did Bill place a high value on things, M&Ms, money and material goods? No, he did not. People mattered. In, in a way, he's like a little Paul. Uh, bigger than Paul probably, though, you know. But, but people, it's about people. And that's what we see here. But there's one change that takes place in Paul's approach to ministry on the third missionary journey, and that is he starts staying longer at different places. Before he would pass through, he'd stay long enough to win some souls to Christ and then raise them up to be elders in the church, and then he'd take off. Now all of a sudden, he's, he's staying for three uh, years in Ephesus. Why? What changed? What changed is Paul now knows his future. He knows that at some point in the future... He's going to face death. He knows that his days are numbered. So all of a sudden, he focuses in on what really matters, and that is pouring the love of God, the word of God, into the people that God brings him to. And so in Acts 20, verse 1, I just want to take the first little phrase there. After the uproar ceased... For context, we need to understand what Paul is thinking in terms of his future. And he came into an uproar in, in, in Ephesus at the end of that time. But Paul's desire is to leave Ephesus and go to Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem, his desire has always been his, his desire was to go to Rome. And then from Rome, it says that he wanted to sail to Spain. So Paul, is he's got big plans. He wants to take the gospel and go. And he's all committed to that. But he also knows that trouble is ahead. God, when Paul first was converted, the first thing God did was send someone to him 
who said to him, God wants you to know that you're going to suffer many things for his namesake. In other words, your life is going to be a drink offering. You're going to suffer. You're going to sacrifice for the sake of God's purpose and calling. And church, I want you to know this. God's calling, his greatest purpose on this earth is always focused on people. We're a church without a building. We're a church without walls. But we'd love to have a building one day. We'd love to have some property, wouldn't we? That's something we're saving money for. But I got to tell you, that will not be the, the, the focus of our church. It can't be. It has to continue to be giving the word of God to people. That's really what matters. But this point here is made. Paul is thinking that this is the last time he'll see his spiritual family. What I mean by that is Paul sees himself as a spiritual father. And so he's spending extra time with those that God has raised up through his ministry, those who God has saved. And he wants like a spiritual dad to pour into them. Just try to catch the the beauty of that, the picture of that. Paul is a spiritual father. If I could give you just a picture in your mind of how God has created and wants the church to function, let me give it to you. By the way, church is not, again, buildings. It's not money. It's not projects. The church is people. And it's not just any people. It's saved people. The church is not unsaved people. We invite unsaved people for the purpose of them being saved so they can be part of God's church, the church's people. And Paul saw that. And here's a beautiful picture. You start out as a babe in Christ when you're first saved. Isn't that wonderful? You're a little baby in Christ, spiritual babe. And we all know what little babes do. Little, we have babes in our church. They make poopy diapers. And when you first get saved, you make a few mistakes. And you don't know better. Why? Because you're just new in the faith. And so for you, you're just so raw and hungry for God. And, and you don't look the way maybe some people think you ought to look. And you don't talk the way they talk and whatever. But you're saved. And as a babe, you, you have two options. You can, you can stay as a spiritual babe in the early days of your walk with God or you can choose to be not just a babe, you can turn into a brat, a spiritual brat. A spiritual brat is someone who never grew up in the faith. They still walk around with a pacifier in their mouth. They're not growing in the Lord. And God wants you to grow. He wants you to go from being a spiritual babe to a spiritual young man or young woman. And he outlines this in the scripture that a young man and young woman, they know enough about the word to defend it. They know enough about the gospel to share it. They know enough about the love of Jesus Christ in their own hearts that they want to love others the same way. They're spiritual young men and women. And what brings spiritual young men and women into spiritual adulthood where they become spiritual fathers and mothers is that spiritual fathers and mothers pour into them. If you want to see a healthy church, you're going to see a church with a lot of spiritual moms and dads who go after the spiritual babes and keep them from becoming spiritual brats who raise them up to be spiritual young men and women so that one day they can be spiritual moms and fathers. That is the beauty of God's church when it functions in a healthy manner. That certainly is the goal here at Vero Bible Fellowship. I don't see a single one of you sitting out there that knows Jesus personally. I do not see you as a Sunday morning attender. I do not see you as somebody who just comes every once in a while when it seems like you, you got the right attitude or the right mindset to go to church. I'm telling you, God sees you as his child, and he has a purpose in your life, and that is to grow you in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus so that you can produce fruit. And the first and greatest place to produce fruit is in God's church. And then to go out and share the gospel with others. And it's not enough for us to just say to somebody that's, you know, a waitress or a waiter in a restaurant, hey, uh, can I pray for you? Yes, you, you can. And you pray with that person, and then they say, well, where do you go to church? Well, I go to Vero Bible Fellowship. Why don't you come with me? It's not enough just to invite them to church. Go ahead and share the gospel with them if the door opens. 
You, can, you, you, every one of you can lead someone to Jesus Christ during the week. That's not a Sunday morning experience. It's all week long that we have opportunity to share Jesus. Amen? And, and so this is Paul. Paul is on this journey, and he's staying longer because these are friendships. These, he has deep relationship. He has poured with immensity uh, the love of God and the teaching of the word into these people. So now all of a sudden he, he turns and he has this more thoughtful, farewell spirit about him. As he sees people for the last time, he stays a little longer. He hugs a little more deeply. It means something deeper. We see that here. Verse, verse uh, 1 even gives us this. I'm going to give you over the course of the next two weeks, today three points, and the next week three more points. But I want you to see, there, there, I'm, I've identified in verses 1 through 16, I've identified six ways that show Paul's love for the church. And that love for the church that Paul has is a love that we should have for the church. And maybe today this will set some of us straight. It'll put us back in a right attitude, a right spirit as we think about God's church and belonging to God's church. So the first point, if you want to write these down, we're going to hit three of these today. First, Paul's love is revealed in his affection. His love is, is revealed in his affection. You, just, you can't even get past the first verse. It says, after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the uproar. Every time you turn around, Paul's causing an uproar, right? Because he's faithful to God. And when you're faithful to God, the world will hate you. That's just the bottom line. So after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples. And after encourage, circle the word encouragement. After, after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. Now, alongside the word encouraged, I want you to, to write this word in. Go ahead and write embraced. Because in the New King James Version, which is also a very accurate word-for-word -word translation, you will find that that word encouragement includes embracing. So you could actually say that Paul sent for the disciples and after embracing them. Now, he, you're not talking about the typical embracing that we would give when we you know, visit family or a friend somewhere else and we're heading home. And it'll be a while before we see them again. And we give an embrace. No, this is an embrace that I won't see you ever again. What kind of an embrace do you think that is? It's a physical embrace. This is, this is something I want to just unfold for just a moment if we can. I don't want to make a bigger deal out of this than it is. But when you think you want to see someone again and you won't, oh. That changes everything. If you look at the Greek and you break it down, it literally means he drew them to himself. He didn't just reach out and give a little hug. He pulled them in. You get a picture of the love of God and the love that Paul has for God's people. This is not a customary hug. This is not a customary kiss, which in that day, was that was the custom. That was the common thing. It was, you, you hugged and kissed everybody. It'd be like today at church, leaving, you'd have to hug and kiss just about everybody here. A hug and a kiss on the cheek. It would take you 30 minutes to go through that process. That was the custom. This is deeper than that. This is deeper. Just think about it. Paul is going through every person in Ephesus with a warm embrace. I'm laboring on this very simple point to bring out something about Paul's personal touch with people. It might seem like we're making a bigger deal than necessary, but I don't want you to miss the fact that this is a spiritual father. He has dedicated his life to these people. He has offered himself up in sacrifice for their sake. This is what it looks like when the church loves one another because we've invested our lives together in one another we're developing relationships we're going out of our way it's a sacrifice of time and energy to meet up just so we can have coffee together and talk about the lord 
This is what the church looks like. Paul's giving us a great example. And just to kind of, if I could just take it a little further, let the scripture defend the scripture. If you just look down in the same chapter, chapter 20, verse 36, Paul swings by. He didn't realize it when he gave the embrace in verse 1. But later he was going to pass by Ephesus. So he calls for the elders to come down to the dock where he's about to sail again. And he, he says, I want to see you one more time. And look, what, look at verse, and when he said these things, he, he, he gave them this, this wonderful charge. Oh, man, it was powerful. He said, you know that while I was with you for three years, I never shrank back from teaching you the whole counsel of God. Man, he taught. And here in verse 37, and there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him. They embraced Paul and kissed him, weeping, being sorrowful most of all because of the word that he spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. In the New King James Version, again, if you want to see what it says there in verse 37, it actually says, then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. You get a little more of the feeling behind what's happening. You can see that this is not just a man who met some folks and spent a little time with them and invited them to church. And No, no, this is a man who gave his life for the people that he met, poured into them on a regular daily basis. And out of that, this deep affection just blossoms. In Romans 16, 16, it says, Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of, of Christ greet you. In Romans 16, 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. In 1 Corinthians 16, 20, greet one another with a holy kiss. 2 Corinthians 13, 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. For, you getting the clue? 1 Thessalonians 5.26, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. 1 Peter 5.14, greet one another with the kiss of love. This was the evident way of the early church. Because they were so engaged in each other's lives. I know what we're fighting against as people living in this century. I know what we're fighting against. And it's hard to, to get in closer. It's hard to embrace. And I'm not talking about a physical embrace. I mean embracing a new relationship and being willing to be discipled and to disciple others, to build those kinds of healthy relationships. But that is really what church is for. God never intended church to be a Sunday morning gathering. And then go home and live your life this week and then come back the next Sunday. You, you, are you following me? So first, Paul's love is revealed in his affection. Secondly, second point, Paul's love was demonstrated in his giving. And by the way, these are progressive. You move from affection to giving. What was Paul doing on his third missionary journey? Well, he's collecting money for the church back in Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem is where the church was started. That's where the, the, the kaboom took place. You know, the Holy Spirit shows up and people are getting saved. The first sermon Peter, Peter preaches, 3,000 people get saved. And just a few verses later, it says, and multitudes are being saved. You couldn't even count the number of Christians. And these were people who had come for, for, uh, for Passover, stayed for, Pente uh, for Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost. They've come from all over the known world, Jews. They've gathered. Now, because they're saved, they can't go home. Why? Many of them can't because uh, my livelihood was in the Jewish community. They, I will not be accepted back in the Jewish community. I'm a Christian now. So they stayed. And so the Christians in Jerusalem took them into their homes. People are, are, are having to share space in homes they're having to eat meals together. They're, they're having church on a daily basis. Incredible things are taking place. It, this is really what's going on. But also, there was not a lot of money. Their money ran out. So Paul takes almost a year to travel 
and go to these other regions of the known world to the churches that he started or were started through his ministry trying to gather funds for the people back in Jerusalem. He dedicated his life to giving. First giving of himself and then giving of whatever resource he could raise. It was all about the church. And so it says, verse 1, after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for where? Macedonia. Why did Paul travel to Macedonia? Well, you'd have to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, where while in Ephesus, Paul wrote a letter to the church in Corinth, and this is what he said. He said, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. He's going around with this message, we all need to give money and we need to have it sent down to Jerusalem. I'm going towards Jerusalem. I can deliver it. I'll take men with me who are able-bodied men. We'll travel together. We'll deliver uh, to the saints that are poor and hurting in Jerusalem the funds that we make. This is what he's doing. And he says in verse 5, and I, and, and, and I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia. He was going to do the same with the Macedonian church. And if you read in what he said to the Corinthians, he said when the Macedonians gave, you're talking about the poorest of the poor people. And he says they welled up in liberty in their giving. These are poor people who have nothing. And yet they welled up in liberty to give to the church in Jerusalem. Wow. And Paul is leading this charge Paul was out fundraising for almost a year. You can always tell a man's love by his sacrifice. Paul spent much of his own life earning his own living by his trade, leather craftsman, making tents and other things. And even though he made sure to say that he had every right to draw his income from the church, which he did, and he did often, but in some situations, he did not draw an income. He went and worked as a tent maker. Why? Because I don't want them to think that somehow I'm here to get money from them. I'm not a charlatan. And so he would allow other churches and other places to actually send him money in some of the places that he thought were holding him suspect. But he had every right. And yet he, he never sought for his own he only sought to help others. Ezekiel 33, 31 says, With their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after covetousness. In other words, some people talk about love, but they covet. Covet is the opposite of love. Love gives. Covetous takes. C.S. Lewis, he wrote this. He said, It's easy to be enthusiastic about humanity, with a capital H, it's a lot easier than loving individual men and women. Loving everybody in general is an excuse for loving nobody in particular. See, it, it starts with love. It shows up in affection. And then it comes out of you in giving. I'm not talking about giving money to the church here. I'm talking about giving yourself to people. Giving is always tied to loving someone. 1 John 3.16, write that down. 1 John 3.16, let me give it to you. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. God loves us and proves it by laying down his life. That means Jesus was all about self-sacrifice. Now watch. The latter part of the verse, in verse 1 John 3, 16. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Jesus laid down his life for those that God would save. We are to lay down our lives for those that God saved. For the church first, then the community. The supreme measure of our sacrifice of love is to be willing to give our lives to the cause of Christ. Some Christians aren't even willing to give their time, let alone their life. They, they might throw a little money towards something, but there's no sacrifice in it. They won't even give their spiritual gifts for the sake of others. They only use them for personal gain. 
Church, listen, we are called by God to lay down our lives. 1 John 3, 17, the next verse. 3.16 we read, verse 17, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? How do others know that you are filled with the love of God? Because when there's a need, you will come to help. When there is a person who's hurting and wounded or depressed or whatever it would be, you will check in on them. You will call upon them. You, you look at people who are growing in Christ, and you're like, man, I love what I'm seeing. Can I come alongside you? Can we grow together? Can we start meeting up? I want to develop a relationship with you. Don't say you love the brethren unless you meet the need of one of the guys or gals that's sitting across from you or that you run into this week. Interestingly, when you think about the Good Samaritan, he saw his demonstration as an act of love, but love as an obligation. He felt obligated. There was no way that Good Samaritan was going to pass by and leave that man in the ditch. It was an, his love was an obligation. For the priest and the Levite, not so much. We don't, listen church, we are to be those good Samaritans. It's an obligation for us. Good Samaritans saw his demonstration as obligation. God isn't interested in our sentiments. God wants our sacrifice. In the next verse, he says, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. What's the greatest way we can love? By doing and by teaching. Doing and teaching, that's the greatest manifestation, demonstration of love. So giving is inseparably tied to loving. You can't say you love God unless you're willing to make a sacrifice. So Paul was a true giver. Here in Acts, we see him running all over the known world collecting money for the hurting saints in Jerusalem. It cost him everything to do it, and he doesn't care. He's going to be faithful. And thirdly, Paul's love was revealed in his teaching. Look at verse 2. We're only covering two verses this morning, but no apology given. This is such rich stuff right here. Acts 20, verse 2, when he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. Paul proved his love for the church by the effort he spent in teaching. Everywhere he went, the first thing Paul would do was make a beeline, if they had a temple, make a beeline for the temple where he could reason from the Old Testament Scripture who Jesus is, Messiah. And there would always be those who would be saved, and there would always be those who would reject his message, and the Jewish leaders hated him for preaching Jesus as Messiah. But there were always those who got saved. And then even the Greeks who were God-fearing, they weren't saved, they couldn't be saved, they couldn't, they couldn't even go into the inner temple or the inner, inner court, they had to stay in the Gentile court. But even they came near to God and they were saved because he preached Christ and they heard the message. This is what Paul did. He taught. He spent his life teaching. Let me, let me give a parenting tip here. I, I've raised four myself and I'm not the authority on parenting, but these are just little tidbits. There's just one, okay, if I could throw it to you. If you really love your children... You're going to take time out of your busy life to teach them. You're not going to relegate all teaching to a school somewhere. You will take time to teach your children. Whenever you see a child that is unruly, undisciplined, a child that's rebellious, there is usually a direct connection to them being untaught. Teaching is not just words either, by the way. Teaching can also come across in discipline. That's not a dirty word. I don't care what the world says. There's ways to teach, and you need to find the way that will get your child's attention. If you've got a 14-year-old girl and you've given her a cell phone, which I don't recommend, but if you did that, you take that, that phone from her. you just do without your phone for a while. Now, that'll, that, that hits home. That hits home. You, you take away, okay? But you teach. 
You do take time to open your mouth and communicate with them. How many of you are communicating who God is to your kids, not just letting your Christian school do it? But you're asking them the questions that need to be asked so that they can come to understand the Bible and they can grow in the Word because mom and dad are vested in me. Man. A student once asked Howard Hendricks why he rose so early in the morning from his study on campus. He had his home that was right off campus. The student would pass by early in the morning on his way to the cafeteria because he washed dishes and he got the tables ready. So it was like 5 in the morning. He had to get up and go to, go to the cafeteria to work. And the light was always on in Howard Hendricks' study. He was one of the professors. And the kid ran into him one day in class. He said, Dr. Hendricks, I noticed that you're up very early and you're always at your desk and you're reading something. What, what are you doing that early? Because you've been teaching these classes forever. You know this stuff like the back of your hand. And Hendricks responded and said, Son, I want my students drinking from a spring of living water and not from a stagnant pool. He himself was a lifelong learner. And so he's pouring into his students a fresh word from God. That's what our kids need from us. The same is true here. If you really love the church, you'll teach the church. You'll give the church the resources to grow up in Christ. Not just as a preacher, but as a member of the fellowship. I'm going to find somebody that I can pour what I know into them. You say, well, I don't know very much. Okay, just give them what you know. What have you learned about God? Find somebody and sit them down at a coffee shop and just talk about it. And then let them share what they know. And before you know, both of you are in a discipling relationship and we'll provide. We spent time this past uh, week as elders, Thursday night, we spent time going over talking about the importance of putting curriculum in the hands of our people so that you could disciple somebody. Those of you who are ready. That's important to us. We want to help you. We're going to link you to a site where you can get, gather information and know what to share when you go to that coffee shop with that person. And the next year, you guys can grow together. Isn't that cool? But the, it's very important. The mark of a loving shepherd. Think about elders and pastors who are the shepherds of the flock. Uh, it says that they are to teach the flock of God in the Bible. A shepherd teaches tirelessly, selflessly. He's driven not by his own desires or his own ideas or his own opinions, but he's driven by the spiritual need of the people that God has given him to pastor, to shepherd. This is very important. Oh, how I pray that God would raise up faithful elders who would teach and preach God's word in churches all over our country. There are so many seminaries and denominations And churches today where preaching is minimized, it's not important anymore. That is partly why you're here today. Because you know the Bible's going to be taught. We're committed to that. It's not about us, it's about the Word. You want that, you need that. You wanted preaching with content. You didn't know this, but you wanted kerugma and didache. That's what you came for, kerugma and didache. You didn't know that's what you wanted, but that's what it is. It's preaching with content. We're going to give you something that you can take home. In the early church, preaching was central. Preaching was the key to the church. The center of it all was the proclamation of God's truth. And nowhere in the New Testament did God change that priority. When Paul wrote to Timothy, who was a preacher, he said in 1 Timothy 4.13, Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid hands on you. Practice these things. Immense your, uh, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress in your preaching, in your gifts. Keep a close watch on yourself. And on the teaching, persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And then later in 2 Timothy, he wrote another letter to Timothy. And and, and it's almost as if he forgot to say it the first time, which he didn't. But he he reinforced it. He said in 2 Timothy 4, 
Verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. In other words, I'm, I'm reminding you how big and how important your calling is as a, as a man of God and as a pastor. And he says, here, here's what he says. He goes, I'm charging you with this. Here it is. You ready? Preach the word. Don't make the sermon about you. Don't make the sermon about psychoanalysis. Don't make the sermon about statistics. Don't make the sermon about social science stuff. Preach the word of God. He says, preach the word. Be ready in in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Reproving, correcting, rebuking, and exhorting is supposed to be in a sermon. Now, let me ask you this question. You think the world wants to hear that? There's a popular pastor. His name's Rick Warren. And he started a church in Saddleback Valley. And this is what he did to start the church. He went around to the homes in Saddleback Valley. First question, do you go to church? If they said yes, then he walked on. If they said no, then he asked questions. Why aren't you going? Give me the reasons why you're not going to church. And they, they all gave reasons. He took the top five reasons for not going to church, and he decided that's what I will make as the, pur- as the purpose of our church. And one of them was, they preach at me. So he said, I won't preach. I'll give talks. This is how the world thinks. We're not, listen, you don't raise up a church of wheat or of tares. It's supposed to be made of wheat. People who will receive a rebuke, a a, a reproof, an exhortation. He says, with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. There it is. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry, Paul is saying to Timothy. That's what we need. That's that's how you love the church. You teach the church. But there's a digression today. Preaching is not happening. I think one reason why it's not happening is because a lot of pastors and a lot of churches no longer believe that the Bible is authoritative. It is not God's word. It's got errors all through it. Blah, 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 blah. In the original text, it is flawless. There are no errors. And we see it as the word of God. And we teach it. See, if you didn't think it was God's word, you wouldn't teach, would you? Why would you teach something you don't believe in? But God calls us to believe it. He calls you to believe it. And because you believe it, that's why you, that's why you want to be a disciple. And that's why you want to take time to disciple others. That the love that's in you would come out to others. Another reason why churches today minimize preaching is because of the abuse that's taken place in the pulpit down through the decades. Pastors who use the pulpit as a whipping post, pastors who would verbally spank their congregations on Sunday morning, pastors who would get up and use it as charlatans to get money from people. It's been, it's been misused. The pulpit's been misused. And that causes people who have intellect, people who come out of an educational system to look at it and go, hmm, that's not working. And so then they come up with a different approach. And they move away from true preaching. It's like going from this to here's good preaching. They go from here, skip that, and get up here on the other side. Now what you end up with is sipid preaching. Sipid at best. It's, it's benign. There's no authority to it. Big church in town. This is a true story. Big church church in town and the pastor told of that church told another pastor that uh you know i used to be a southern baptist he said really what what happened you know why aren't you a southern baptist he said well i used to be a southern baptist back when i believed that jesus was god he no longer believes that jesus is god and has one of the biggest churches in town You see the problem? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had 
movies and musicals and all kinds of new materials and new media things in our church, how exciting that would be. Wouldn't it be wonderful if pastors were more like showmen and got up and just really it just you know held our attention? It's not what the word's for. The word is for you to grow spiritually, not to be entertained in the flesh. God help us. I shared the story with you, how true it is, the church in Southern California back in the 70s. They were always wanting to do a new thing for Christmas, a new show, a new presentation. They put hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in their musical presentations. And this year, they came up with something called the Living Christmas Tree. The first church to ever do it. The Living Christmas Tree. And they did it. And everybody was wooing and on and all over Los Angeles. And guess what? Another church said, we got to do that. And the next year, that first church said, well, we did that last year, but we got to do something better this year. What are we going to do? Here's an idea. Let's have an angel that comes out of the ceiling. We're talking a church that's huge with a high ceiling. And he'll land on the final song at the right moment of the song. He'll come out of the sky and he'll land on the top of the Christmas tree and light up. That's what we'll do. So they rigged everything, got the pulley system just right. Night of the first show, show. And they had some guy up there as an angel. Halfway down to the tree, all of a sudden there was something that caused a jerk in the rope that he was on the line, and it caused him to flail. Can you imagine this scene? An angel flailing? An angel that can't fly? And, and he started moving so much, the thing started going forward, go back, go forward, go back. And now he is freaking out, and he's getting sick. <laughs> and he would come out over the crowd <laughs> and yell out, get me the blank down from here. And finally, <laughs> no kidding, I'm not making this up. May that always be the case when we move away from sound biblical teaching and we have to move into the entertainment to move into other contextualization and things in order to make church interesting. God help us. God help us. Father, this morning I want to thank you for your word and I thank you for the Apostle Paul because of the great gospel that saved him for the rest of his life he saw himself as a living sacrifice. And he preached that message to the believers that all of us are called to be living sacrifices. That is our spiritual act of worship. And Lord, we, to love the way Paul loved, to embrace and have affection the way Paul did, we first have to have relationship that's that meaningful, deeper level relationships where we've invested in one another and where if we knew we wouldn't see them again oh my that embrace would be different we pray lord that today you would just speak to our hearts and we would see our place in the church to not only love the way you loved and 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 demonstrate that love in activity but lord also that we would love your word and we would share your word with others we would we would begin to build discipling relationships some are already do, are always already doing that in such a beautiful way we thank you for that it's happening in our fellowship you're awakening this congregation through the act series but lord we don't want to stop halfway we want to go all the way with what you're doing and what the church is supposed to be doing so continue to guide us lord by the holy spirit that we would be a true church in this modern day and that people would be saved and they would be transformed 
and sanctified by your work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remember that we are going to have an opportunity to embrace and love Jackie and, and care for her and show by our words uh, how much we love her. And then in a few weeks, probably the second week of September or the third week, I'm not sure, right in there, we will show her by our giving how much we love her, okay? God bless each of you. Uh, they've set up back in the back. They've got some, some beverage. They've got some light snacks. So, Jackie, if you can make your way back there, uh, good, she's already back there. Great. And you can go and say, say what you want to share with her, okay? God bless each of you. Good to have you today.